Hello everyone, Kent Bressler here. I want to welcome you to Kent's Kidney Stories. During our time together um, over these podcasts, I'd like to uh, discuss kidney disease. I'd like to tell you about my journey as a transplant patient, but also talk about dialysis, kidney donation, and just about anything else that might be of interest. Kent's Kidney Stories, a podcast endorsed and sponsored by kidneysolutions.org. Well, hello, Kent Bressler here. Um, we're going to do some more podcasts, and I've told you how much I enjoy doing this, but actually today is going to be a real special day for me because I have two really good friends, uh, Jason and Dale, who have come on, are going to be coming on and talking about uh, about their their journeys with kidney disease. Both of them, believe it or not, have had a, an amputation of a leg. And the other, they both have had kidney transplants. So what we're going to do is start with a, a, a nice prayer, and then we're going to get started. These two guys are going to get to know each other, and we'll just listen in. It should be pretty good. Matter of fact, I know it will be. Dearest Lord, we pass many things in our life, and we know that without you, we have nothing. I ask you for the strength to make sure that everything goes well with our conversations with Dale and Jason today. But also I'd like to ask you to watch out all for all those folks that uh, are in the ICUs now with this virus and all the potential people that could get ill, want them to have to take care of themselves and do it right. Lord, I ask all of this in your name. Amen. Amen. Dale and Jason, I'm gonna, I'm just gonna let you guys have at it because I think you're almost like twins. <laughs> it's <laughs> it's great. You're probably pretty much the same age, so, and and you've had the same circumstances. And I think the audience would love to hear your story. So, let's go. All righty, Kent. Well, uh, thanks so much for uh, bringing Dale and I together. It's uh, I made a joke before I, I hit the recording button that said I feel like I'm looking in a mirror. Uh, <laughs> just uh, right off the bat, right, right off the bat, Dale and I, you know, from the torso up, we're pretty identical, and you know, more than likely from the legs down, we may may be identical too, right? So um, yeah, <laughs> very very excited for this opportunity to to get to know Dale more, and uh, thank you, Kent, for kind of bringing us together. Uh, and uh, creating the platform for you know this to happen here. So um, so Dale, uh, so far from what I know, um, your name is Dale, and you're from Idaho. Tell me a little bit yeah. more about yourself. <laughs> well, so uh, I uh, started my journey in this whole world of health issues uh, at 12 years old. Wow. I became diabetic. Uh, ended up in uh, crashing into the. ER of hospital in Fallon, Nevada. Uh, pretty, pretty troubling times as uh, a kid, and uh, you know went went through life without a whole lot of problems. And uh, then at about the age 25, things just started blasting me out of nowhere. And by the time I was 30 years old, I was, uh, you know, in stage stage five kidney failure wow. and going on to dialysis and uh you know things kind of have uh, been a journey since then how about yourself uh pretty pretty similar um i wasn't diagnosed with diabetes probably until my early 20s though uh and you know diabetes is one of those things where uh you get diagnosed with it you get told by the doctor that you have it and if it's at a young enough age uh, you think to yourself, well, okay, let me take this seriously. And after you start to do that, you start to realize, I don't feel sick. I don't feel like there's anything wrong with me. So it just becomes one of those things where it's in the back of your mind, but since you're not feeling anything, you're not necessarily doing anything about it, right? Until it rears its ugly head at you and starts to create a 
domino effect with inside your body. <laughs> so that's that's pretty much what happened to me. Uh, I I overall uh, went through that in my early 20s, uh, admittedly, and um, honestly didn't really focus a lot on my diet or on being disciplined with my medication or being disciplined with following up with my doctor. Um, not not until I needed to. So it was one of those reactional situations compared to being proactive, which was a big mistake on my part. But um, you know, not knowing any better, I I I, I just didn't know any better. Uh, I was diagnosed with uh, Charcot foot uh, in 2016. Uh, that's when the the bones in your foot collapsed. So that happened on my right side. Uh, I had a amputation done right below the knee. Uh, in October of 2018, so I had I had about a better part of a year and a half, almost two years, struggling with that, um, trying to get it fixed. I went to try and get it fixed, but unfortunately, the bones had eroded to the point to where there was nothing left to fuse to to fuse my foot. So the only option left at that point was to amputate. Uh, during that time, I had already started uh, dialysis. Uh, when I went in in the hospital for the Charcot foot, that's when the whole kidney issue uh, bubbled up to the top as well. At that point, I was at the end of stage three, going into stage four. And um, July of 2018, I started on peritoneal um, dialysis. And uh, that's shortly after, I believe it was either September, August, September, October of that year was when I met Kent and uh, his, his partner, um, Amanda, and started... Uh, you know, staying in in, uh, in 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 close contact with them, and they really helped me navigate the transplant process. And uh, thanks be to God, January 16th of this year, uh, I I received the gift of life by having a living kidney donation through a paired exchange. So uh, that's that's kind of the Cliff Notes condensed version <laughs> for myself there. Yeah, that's that that's fantastic. Yeah, yeah, for me, uh, you know, I. Uh, when I when I first started finding out about the whole kidney thing, uh, I was at a routine uh, diabetic appointment, um, and you know they checked me in, they checked my blood pressure. Uh, doctor came in, talked about blood sugars, and at the end of the visit, he says, uh, "I got a bottle of pills here. You need to start taking these." Um, handed them to me and basically walked out of the room to see his next patient. Wow. And uh, <laughs> so I, uh, you know, at the age 25, I was ready to conquer the world, you know. Basically, I struggled with diabetes since I was 12 years old, but uh, I was into, into sports a lot. Mm -hmm. And so the exercise kind of saved me, my diabetes yep. and, and, and kept me going. Um, but then 25, he handed me the bottle of pills, didn't tell me what they were for or what. And uh, so the first first circular circular um, file I went past, I threw them, threw them away. And, uh, you know, five years later, I'd find myself uh, in congestive heart failure and and uh, all kinds of stuff was going on. And, you know, went to a doctor, nephrologist and that doctor pretty much saved me, got me on transplant list. And I had a uh, transplant from my adopted sister. Uh, I'm adopted myself mm. and uh, I was adopted out of Portland, Oregon. And my parents uh, adopted my sister out of Juarez, Mexico. Wow. And, and she ended up being a five antigen match. Oh my goodness. And, Whoa. Yeah. <laughs> And, and so, and I'm uh, O negative as well. <laughs> That'd so, be me too. It, I'm also a negative. That, yeah. And, you know, so that just makes it harder, but she ended up being a good match and I got a good transplant and I was doing fantastic. And uh, then uh, my then wife at the time um, decided that she was too young to be dealing with chronic kidney problems yeah. yeah and and she gave me the boot and you know wow. found out later when i was in seattle um getting my transplant at the university of washington um 
she was in Seattle too, supposedly taking care of me at the hospital, but to find out later she was uh, actually hooked up with a old boyfriend of hers in Seattle there from high school and uh, they were having their good times. So uh, <laughs> wow. I, uh, you know, I uh, pretty much took the shaft and 10 years after my transplant, I lost my kidney because I hypertension just took it out, you know, and so if I were to uh, have any suggestions that I feel very strongly about, it's about uh, helping to educate people on hypertension and um, helping them learn that it does nothing for you, whether you're a kidney patient, whether you're a normal human being, hypertension can kill you. And uh, any, anyhow, so then I was good for 10 years and and then I was on dialysis for seven and a half uh, after that kidney transplant failed. And uh, then I got another transplant, finally got the call. You know, uh, God has mysterious ways of working. You know, I wanted a transplant seven and a half years earlier, but after, uh, after everything was said and done and uh, I got the second transplant and looked back on it, God... God's timing is impeccable. Amen to that. And it was, it was, it was the right time. I got my second transplant June 23 of 2016. <laughs> and, uh, and uh, you know, even looking back on it, the day that I got called up for my transplant, I finished the fence for our goats that we have, or they would have got out while we were gone. <laughs> and, and and so that that's the timing that God has. He even knows that the goats need taken care of. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> and, he knows and, it all. Yes. Oh. Yeah, he does. And so I, uh, you know, got my second kidney transplant. There there were some struggles during that. And uh, you know, if I if I look back, the only thing that got me through this second set of. Uh, dialysis and the second transplant is prayer amen to that you know that's that's um, one thing that i can definitely echo uh what you're saying there prayer and faith has really carried me through me being uh 39 years old i would you know having two young boys who are teenage age now and a wife i i can say that i'm, I'm blessed because you know my wife has been supportive throughout all this you know through working in a space that is surrounded by boxes for my 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 peritoneal dialysis treatment that I would do at home, to helping care for me. She's she's been my dietitian. She's been my nurse. She's been my wound care nurse. You know, th this is it's been a tremendous blessing for me. And uh, with without my family and without my faith and my prayer life, and the community yep. from our church, I I can say that I I would not be here right now. I, I would not be here right now or, you know, probably not have even gotten a transplant. A big part of the reason why I have my transplant is because a friend of mine from church um, uh, tried to donate his kidney to me and he was a match. Um, due to the age difference, he was a better match for another person uh, within the same transplant program. So he still, you know, he still was willing to donate his kidney through the paired exchange program and that allowed the transplant center to find a match for myself so because of my brother from church uh, because of my brother in Christ I was able to receive my kidney transplant he's kind of in a holding pattern right now to donate his because of the whole um, ec um, ep epidemic they're in right now he just got a, a text message yesterday from the coordinator saying that they're going to start to explore the possibility of opening up and yeah, possibly late May he can he can he can donate um, so he's he's excited about that and that makes me excited for him uh, especially now that I'm, I'm well enough to where I can I can be there at the hospital with him you know uh, and just try to help out as long as these restrictions are all kind of gone hopefully that's the case I would like to be there for him the way he was there for me um, on my transplant day but uh, prayer prayer is paramount it is such such a critical component in this entire process um yeah yeah i want to I, I just want to point something out dale it's it's crazy because you mentioned that your adopted sister 
was adopted and she, so was she was was she from Juarez, Mexico? Did, did I understand yes. that right? That yeah, that's where she was adopted at. Both of us were adopted uh, as babies. Right. Okay. You know, so so I look at it from the from the perspective that God was looking out for me clear back when I was three days old. <laughs> right. Right. Yes. Indeed. So. So the the for me what what makes my eyebrows raise when I hear that, you know, the whole story itself is is amazing. But looking at it through my paradigm, I was born and raised in El Paso, Texas, which is the sister uh-huh. city to what is Mexico. Yes. So like there's almost like another connection that I would want to say use that word in that situation there between you and I. You know what I mean? Like there's that that part of the country you're you're Dale in Idaho and I'm Jason in San Antonio and he's Kent in Kerrville and yet Dale and Jason have a connection to this other part of Texas. So yeah. that, that's awesome. Yeah. The thing that I really enjoyed uh after getting my first transplant from my sister was I used to tell everybody that uh, when they'd ask me what my nationality was, <laughs> I'd, I'd tell them that uh, I'm half black, half white, I'm five ounces Hispanic, and uh, five ounces woman, too, just to throw you off. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. So, so, so uh, since my transplant, I've described myself this way, and I, for you, it's slightly different, but it's kind of the same. So the way I think of myself is, hi, I'm Jason. I have three kidneys and I have one foot. Nice to meet you. Yeah. Uh, Dale, yeah. Uh, if, I, if, if I'm thinking right, is Dale, four kidneys, one foot. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, that, that's just kind of a, uh, that's kind yeah. of how I think of myself now is, is, is like that. Um, a, yeah. A, I- a question for you. So, where do they put that fourth kidney? Is it on the left side of where the right, where the donated kidney was? Is I I I actually had a nephrodectomy um, about a third of the way through dialysis, uh-huh. um, and that's where they removed my transplanted kidney because actually after my transplanted kidney failed. Um, while it was in me, years after it had failed, I had acute rejection. Oh, yeah, yeah. And yep. and so, so after that acute rejection, then I had to have it pulled out. Gotcha. And 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 so they put the new kidney right back in the same place. Same place. Gotcha. Uh, yeah. An- another thing to add about my story, kind of, is that. You know, I don't know how many people know. I also had a pancreas transplant. Oh, okay. The first oh, I didn't around. know that. I didn't know that. Wow. Yeah, and and so that pancreas transplant, you know, it was great. It worked great, but it only went for eighteen months. Um, and they they haven't uh, totally perfected the pancreas transplant situation yet. There's uh, a lot of things involved with that that uh, maybe you know a lot of people don't understand is that the pancreas does more than just the job of producing insulin Absolutely. It, also per- it also produces the enzymes for your biofluid and um, so when they transplant a, a pancreas in you they have to dump that biofluid because your your original your uh, um, how do I want to say it your um, your birth pancreas Mm -hmm. continues to produce the the biofluid and so they have to dump the biofluid from the second pancreas and so they either have to dump that into your bowel or into your um, bladder and there's huge risks of infections because of either of those two processes like especially going uh, bladder um yeah it both you know they they Uh, I, I said, well, what's what's my best case scenario? And they said, you know, at the time that I did it, this was back in 2000. They said, wow, we're not, we can't give you a, an absolute on that. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. And and so uh, I did that. So you know, I 
as I was five ounces woman, and they also consider a pancreas transplant to be as painful as childbirth. And and so I went through the childbirth thing too in another way, the pain of it. <laughs> That's just another like, box you've checked, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so, so, you know, I mean, I'm not, uh, I, God has been very good to me when it comes to pain. I have a huge tolerance for pain. Um, and so I didn't realize it that much. Um, you know, they had me on a morphine pump at the time and I wasn't using it. And the doctor's like, we need you to use this because that's part of your healing process is not to fight the pain. Mm. Right. Right. So, exactly so, right. so any, anyhow, you know, I, I, I feel very blessed by God, um, through this whole situation. And I wish, I wish that, uh, I could help other people, other kidney patients understand what an important role that God plays in this whole health process when we do suffer from an illness like kidney disease, because, um, it's huge. It's huge what God can do to keep you motivated and willing to keep fighting because kidney disease will consume you if you allow it. If you oh, allow yeah. it is correct. Oh, that, yeah. And that's the, yeah. that's the important part of what you just said there is that if you will allow it. And so, so many people fall in that, in that, in that trap of, of allowing it. And it's, it's, it's one of those things where you need to rise above and, um, it's, it's easier said than done. Granted, it's easier said than done, but it is, it is possible. It is possible. And it's, you, you get to a point to where I know I'm like this. I'm, I'm sure you are too, where even now I, I look back and it's like, how did I get here? You know what I mean? How did I do it? I don't, Yeah. I, I know when I say I, that that's the words coming out of my mouth, but it's not, it's how did my family and I do this, you know? And it's, you know, all by the grace of God, my friend. That's that's really yeah, the yeah. the only way that I can rationalize an answer to say out loud is only by the grace of God. Yeah, uh, amen to that. Yes, sir. So I I, well, I want to uh, go ahead, Ken. Well, I this is going so good. I w- I would just make the point that Dale, your your willingness to come on things like this and what you're doing for AAKP and what you're doing, you're already you're already doing a good amount of things for the kidney community. And every time you do that, you know, it's God given talent. He puts that pressure on you, but he also gives you the challenge to do it and do it well. And you're doing fine with that. I wouldn't pressure myself into thinking that you have to do all just make sure you're doing God's will. He talks to you. He tells you, and what you're doing is fantastic. And hopefully you and I can guide Jason at some point. He's so fresh, he's only like three, four months out. Three months out. If yeah. we can get him over a year, right, at least, then we can we've just adopted another kidney warrior. Right? <laughs> yeah. 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 So I uh I'm I mentor in several uh dialysis units here in North Idaho. And I, I try to tell each one of my fellow patients that are on dialysis, you know, I tell them, I, I'm like, you know, you've gone through a lot for what you've gone through. Take your experiences and the next person that sits beside you, share your experience with that person because maybe your experience will help that patient through a, a, an experience that they're going through and you'll take the humps out of the road for them and they don't have to push pull and drag themselves over those humps because of you sharing your situation with them that will help improve their chances through what they're going through so i think every single one of us have an experience that we can share with another person yeah and it's an important one it's you yeah and, uh, you know, I, I'm not medical, um, but I've been through a lot and I can't tell a patient what to tank or what to do, but I can tell them what my situation was and how I made it through it. And I can encourage them to take their situation and some of their feelings to their doctor, 
to their medical professionals and get advice that will help them specifically with their situation. Yeah, ex- absolutely. And J- Jason, your experiences are, you've ha- had some good experiences just in the first three or four months. And s- even preoperatively, you've, you've had some. But you don't have, you've got a family to raise, buddy. You <laughs> have a very important task on hand. Your, your obligation to yourself is to take care of yourself, but you got to take care of your family too. Um, so all this advocacy and all of this help, just do it as you have time. Your family comes first. Thank you very much for saying that. And that's that's very true. And especially in this, uh, you know, the current climate that we're in right now, uh, it's, it's becoming more and more um, evident to me, uh, you know, to the point to where uh, our family has a schedule <laughs> now. So we've, 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 we've created this schedule to make sure everyone knows what they're supposed to be doing throughout the day. Uh, my wife is blessed enough to work from home and that's been the case ever since before the whole stay at home orders were, you know, rolled out here in Texas. Uh, my two boys are now going, are now going quote unquote to school here at home. Um, I'm, I'm still on disability, so I don't have a nine to five that I go to, but, um, it's like my wife has two jobs, her, her job where she earns money <laughs> and also her job of being a mom here, right. And, and a wife, you know, I, I have a job of being a husband and a father, uh, but I don't have that, that nine to five that I need to go to virtually to take my attention away. So it's uh, frees up pockets of time in the day to, you know, work on projects like this, make sure that our, 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 our boys are hitting their goals, you know, academically. Yep. Um, so now I know that I can build in, build, build in time for this advocacy work. But so you're actually correct, Kent, you know, my family's first and with this transplant, with me feeling better, with me no longer being anemic, with my hemoglobin above 14 now, uh, I have the energy uh, to do what I've been wanting to do the past three years that mentally yep. I was, I, I planned to do, but when it was time to get up and do it, it was like, nope, not going to happen. You know, it's, I just don't have the energy for it, but thankfully now I do. So it's, uh, uh, we're, we're starting to reap the benefits of, you know, kidney, uh, donation, uh, three months later and beyond is, uh, my prayer, uh, that we continue to see the benefits of this transplant beyond. Yeah, Jason, you know, I can I can say and and I can say this to every kidney patient out there that um, they have a story to tell. Yep. And the story that they have to tell may not be in Washington, D.C., may not be uh, in in front of any group of people. It may be sitting down at a keyboard and communicating with people through social media. It may be communicating uh, over a podcast like what we're doing right now, Mm -hmm. but every single person has a story and has an ability to communicate with other people in some fashion or form. You know, for myself, I've I've chosen a a little bit more of a national stage and, and a bigger stage. And it's not because I'm the best speaker in the world. It, it's not because I'm smarter than anybody else. The only reason I chose this, this the route that I've taken is because I'm not afraid of people. Hmm. I'm hmm. not afraid to get in front of people and tell them my story. I'm not ashamed of what I've been through. I, it's what I need to do with my story is I need to make my story take the bumps out of the road like i said earlier for other people and if i can if i can do that by talking to people uh in a a larger capacity um to help educate them to help other patients then that's the position i've done and and that's what i've chosen not every not every advocate is is the same person that i am that's just what I've chosen. They can choose something totally different for themselves. Excellent. And that's, that's definitely um, great advice. And that's so true. Everyone does have a story to tell. Um, just a matter of finding your lane, right? So that way you can, yeah. you can excel in that. Uh, I, I want to touch on something, Dale, that you, know, you and I have in common, right? So um, both of us are amputees. Both of us have received kidney transplants. 
I just wanted, wanted to kind of talk with you a little bit about about that aspect because that's a that that's that's an additional wrinkle in the picture, right? Uh, so can you kind of share some of your experiences of of uh, being an amputee while being on dialysis and while while recovering from transplants? You, you know, for for me, um, I got my amp amputation uh, just this last August. Um, uh, my leg got uh, cut off um, below the knee and it was a tough thing for me it was really tough uh, like I said earlier um, I was really into sports mm -hmm. um, and um, you know my my number one thing I was a track star you know I mm. in the 100 meter 200 meter I never got beat and and back in high school and so when i found myself that uh getting my leg cut off mm -hmm. it, it took the, it took the wind out of my sail um but i got my leg cut off and it was just before the um national patient meeting back in washington dc that aakp aakp puts on every year and uh, I wasn't going to go. I was registered to go, everything. And I don't know. It was God working on my heart saying, you know, don't let, don't let this bother you, Dale. You just need to go. And don't, don't worry about being embarrassed because you don't have a leg. Don't be embarrassed because you have to be in a wheelchair. Just do it. And so I told my significant other, Gloria, that was going with me, um, we're going to go. And she said, really? And the meeting was two weeks after I got my leg cut off. Wow. And um, I said, yep, we're going to do it. And so we figured things out and, and we went. And that's uh, one of the things that I can tell people about AAKP that um is is one of the things i think that would warm people's hearts is when i went to that meeting i was accepted with open arms even though that i had been to washington dc walking around helping advocate for other patients walking and i showed up there in a wheelchair and i was accepted just the same way in a wheelchair as i was when i was on my own two feet and so for me, um, after everything is said and done, it's made me stronger. Yes. And it gives, it gives another story, another piece of the pie that I can add to the picture to help other patients um, with kidney disease, with amputations, uh, just a mindset. And that mindset is that we got to focus on Christ to allow him to work in our lives to help other people. Yes. Yes, indeed. Well, one, one, uh, one important lesson that, that I've learned uh, going through, you know, the various health um, hurdles that I've encountered and that I've overcame is the importance of being there. Uh, whether I was feeling anemic and low energy and and I woke up at 11 and took a nap at 4 and I had to be somewhere at 6.30 and um, being on dialysis and having to know that I had to be home by 9 because I had to start my treatment to be ready to go to a doctor's appointment the next day. 10 hours later in my treatments, 9.5 hours during the evening. Um, so that's kind of a tall order for someone who's not feeling that well to begin with. But what I realized is that just by being somewhere with other people, you're helping the other people you 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 may not be the one doing the heavy lifting and doing the organizing and facilitating a meeting or speaking to people but just your simple presence there is a source of of joy and also comfort and also inspiration for those that you're around um and that that's that's a message that that i want to help sp spread around is that just the simple matter of being there whether you're having health issues regarding your kidneys or an amputation, you making the trip to that conference two weeks after your amputation and you just being there lifted up so many people around you right. because they thought, wow, look at Dale. 
he just had a major surgery two weeks ago and he's here to travel alone is a tall order for anybody now throw throw in a wheelchair into that picture and and it's it's harder so you know you making that effort and making that trip lifted up a lot of people um, and that that's a lesson that I've learned myself it's just the the importance and the power that comes with just simply being present uh, one one person that I want to encourage you, Dale, to uh, to look up his his name is John Register. I'm not sure if you know who he is or not, but no. um, um, I had the pleasure of meeting this gentleman last August. Uh, the Amputee Coalition has a national conference every year, and uh, luckily last year it was here in San Antonio. So um, our local amputee community. Um, had scholarships to to you know give away to this conference. This conference is it's like over three hundred dollars to attend, and that's just to go. That doesn't include travel if it's somewhere else. So um, my wife and I were blessed to receive a scholarship each to attend this conference, and uh, John Register was one of the keynote speakers. He actually suffered an injury on the track that led to his amputation, hmm. and he is a Paralympic sil- silver medalist uh, in, in, in track and field and he's an above the knee amputee by the way he's not even wow. a, he's not even a wow. below the knee amputee so he's a he's a to use the word inspiration to try and associate that with John Register is it does not do it justice um, if you go to his website there's videos on there he's actually done a, a TED talk as well after you're done listening to John Register you're ready to like run through a wall because that's how much inspiration <laughs> he gives you. Uh, so I I I want to share that with you. I I, I met him. Was fortunate enough to uh, my wife and I to you know take a picture with him and kind of chat with him for a little while. And he's just a guy that you want to be around. So um, he's he's active on social media. So I'm sure you'll have no problem finding him. But um, he's okay. definitely a, a a good re- a good resource to have and look at the content he puts out and um, especially you saying that you know. You were a track star. This is a guy that you can probably relate to. So, just just wanna just wanna share that with you as well, Dale. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, I, I think I think it's the I think it's that way in uh, in the in the kidney world as well. Yep. Um, you know, I I I got into this whole kidney thing in uh, in late 1998, early 99, and. Uh, you know, I, I felt like I was alone. There, there wasn't many people out there, yep. but I can, I can tell you now, uh, especially since I'm involved and, and now it's just a matter of uh, getting on social media and lit and looking. Um, there are strong, uh, patient leaders all over the U S yes. and, um, you know, Kent, myself, I, I can name, I don't know how many people spread out through all over the U.S. Each one of us need to connect with several of those people and use them as mentors in our own lives to help us through the tough times. You know, when I was getting my amputation, um, Part of my reason for amputation is because I had some medical professionals not do what they should have mm. with me having a kidney transplant, and that ended up in my amputation. But I reached out to a, a person, you know, that I several people that I know Kent knows, um, and and many people in the kidney surroundings know them. Uh, one was Dave White, the other was Richard Knight. Mm-hmm. And uh, Derek Forfang was another one, and 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 another person you know I could list is Nicole Jefferson. You know these these are people that I look to as mentors in my life, and all all these people, Kent, myself, we're not in it for the notoriety. We're mm-hmm. we're in it because we lived it, and we want to help other people. And so I would suggest to every kidney patient out there, no matter whether you've been dealing with it for uh, just a day or whether you've been dealing with it for years, 
find some other kidney patients out there to connect with, to become mentors with. Yep. Well said. You know, the mentorship program at AAKP, uh, it's growing by leaps and bounds. And I think everybody should be involved in it in some way or shape because it gives them a chance not only to tell their story and enlighten others, but it gives them hope that what they're doing is is for the better good of their society of our society. Kidney yeah. patients, you know, we're not a big group. Cancer, uh, 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 diabetes, and all the other groups are much bigger. But I think that in the kidney world. It is so, it limits your, your joy to veer. In other words, it makes you at risk all the time. It, it is very progressive and it can lead to death. I've always said that, that point, that it's either dialysis, transplant, or death. There are really no other choices. And to have someone like you said, to mentor like Jason has, has uh, had an opportunity to meet a lot of people uh, through through this program, but those people like you and James and and all of people that were associated with people you named have been through it, and they want to help. It's not a matter of you know you're having a hard time getting a hold of. We can get you in touch with anybody anytime. It's that easy, and people that are going to give you solid, good information that's not medical in nature, but more so human in nature. They put the human side into it. Because yeah. you can do all numbers. You can be a numbers guy, you're creating this and that. But it really, when it boils down to it, it's your ability to speak to somebody from the heart and tell them what it's like to live with kidney disease. Yeah, I, I, I think Kent, Kent, going right along with that, and I'm sure that you can relate to this just the same, we have we have kidney transplants and and we're doing relatively well but we have days where we struggle ourselves yeah and we need we as advocates need people to reach out periodically too just to help raise our spirits i say so many times to people they say you're always doing so good dale well, that's because they don't see me on the days I'm not doing good because I don't come out of the house. <laughs> well, no matter how long, no matter how long you've had your transplant, in and, and I've told I've told Jason this on several occasions. You got to stay in your own lane. Yep. Yeah. You can't you can't be passing. You can't be accelerating. You can't be stopping on a dime. You have to be your own best advocate, and the only way you can do that is knowledge and finding the folks, like you said, Dale, that have experienced it. They're not going to lead you astray. They're going to tell you how it happened to them, and if it works, use it. If it doesn't, mm -hmm. discard it. Move on. But don't get out of your lane. You get out yeah. of your lane just asking for trouble. Yeah, and, and, and each, each one of us are humans, and uh, we can we can use that help of calling somebody and say, Hey, I'm struggling and have them say, Hey, I know, I know what you mean. Uh, how can, is there anything I can do to help? Yep. And that means a lot when you feel kicked in the stomach. Yeah. Jason's been, Jason's been a model, a model warrior. And I, he's going to do well, just like we have, because he's committed to it. He's taken yeah. on the responsibility. I'm so proud of him. Hmm. Listen, you guys, we've done, uh, I think, a good service for the community, especially in the kidney community. And I think you two have, have bonded to a point where now I think you can do, you can do good things together. And I'm glad that you were able to come on, come on with me on this podcast. You know, we searching, searching all the time for an answer, and the answer is in Christ. We know that. So till we meet again, till we talk again, keep breathing. Amen for that. Amen.